are about to begin session two, Infectious Diseases One, Simval Pinto Brandão, from Fiocruz, Pernambuco. Good morning. First of all, I would like to thank Sabino for the invitation on behalf of Fiocruz in Pernambuco. Uh, we will have four speakers, beginning with Claudio Ribeiro from the Instituto Oswaldo Cruz. We were born in Malay in the Brazilian Atlantic Forest, Harry Monkeys in Gobi. Uh, second uh, speaker is Inês Vigan from Madagascar, Instituto Pasteur Madagascar. Uh, address the new challenge from Alara Pompro in Madagascar. And in the second group of uh, Claudio, uh, please, for first presentation. I have to make short, a very long story that started a long time ago on malaria in the Atlantic Forest and the possibility that monkeys are involved in transforming malaria in a zoonosis in that region. Uh, I will have some time to show you uh, and to speak a bit about um, a very small proportion of cases that are acquired and transmitted outside the Amazon region where the transmission generally occurs. Uh, most of I'm going to say has been published last year by invitation of the Memorial of the Instituto Oswaldo Cruz uh, that is an open journal, so it's easy to assess. And uh, this is a general panorama of the historical series of malaria in Brazil. And we have some information we can obtain from this pictogram. The first is that the, 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 the uh, lower number were, the lower numbers were recorded in, in the 1960s. And uh, we had, for some time, a quite stable situation. And then uh, the number of cases started to rise from the moment the Amazon was very disorganized and uh, not well planned, occupied by migrants. And this resulted in a very huge increase in the number of uh, malaria cases and also the proportion of cases that were registered inside the Amazon. So it started to be more than 90% in the uh, late 80s and more than 99% since uh, the early 90s. Uh, we can also see here that in spite of uh, a, 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 an effective control program started to be uh, in place here, we have some peaks uh, almost each five years uh, and uh, we have now something very uh, successful from the point of view of control since we have now 140,000 cases as compared to 600 in the 2000 um, in the uh, 2000 uh, also I have to say that to draw your attention to the fact that Vivex and Pulsipro were more or less uh, represented in 50% of cases and then it started to move from the moment that the control started to be effective. And then, as you can see here, the proportion of falciparum malaria, which usually reflects the effectiveness of a control program, decreased very, um, decreased very sharply. And it's now around 15% of the cases. So there is now a task force involved in trying to eliminate falciparum uh, together with the efforts to eliminate malaria, but starting for by plasmodium falciparum. This is what as I have said, uh, from the 80s to now, we have more or less a five year cycle of increase that has not been observed, uh, have not been observed in the last 10 years. So it it's shows a bit the sustainability of the control measures that are in place now. And we have, as I told you, 100,000 cases that corresponds to less than we reached the, in, the, in the last year. Uh, the goal for, established by the WHO for reduction that should be of 75% from 2000 in the 55 countries that were considered to be in process of elimination of malaria. So Brazil reached this goal last year. It was supposed to be reached this year. So I have also to say that um, 
more than 99%, 99.6% last year of the malaria cases are registered in the Amazon region, which correspond to nine states of the country, 60% of the total uh, territory. And 0.4% um, only are distributed in the 40% of the uh, nation, uh, which has <coughs> something around 85% of the population and around 90% of the uh, gross product. Uh, and this decrease is reflected by the data shown here, where you can see that it has been important both for hospitalization and death. And uh, this were the data from last year and uh, also up to March this year. And uh, you can see that the, the, the decrease is very important, but you can also see that the proportion of death outside the Amazon, outside the area where transmission does occur, is very important. And these 14 cases, for instance, have been registered among 500 cases. And these 22 uh, deaths were registered in 140,000 cases. So as you can see, the chance of dying from malaria, if it is diagnosed outside the um, outside the endemic area where people are used to health professionals are used to consider and to evocate the diagnosis when facing a fibrillar cases is much higher outside the Amazon. This is true also for other countries outside the transmission area. And uh, in last year it was 160 times more you have you uh, a patient diagnosed outside the Amazon region would have 160 times more chances of dying as compared to one diagnosed inside the Amazon. So it's very uh, impressive data. And uh, it can illustrated by data uh, obtained in the National Institute of Infectology here in Fio Cruz that receives around, uh, I would say now, more than 50% of cases of malaria uh, registered in the state where uh, around 30% of cases took 10 days between symptoms and the moment of diagnosis. This is very, uh, uh, very important and even too much uh, important delay for the diagnosis. Uh, in Brazil, in the Amazon, this delay is around uh, two days, 48 hours in 60% of the cases. So people are much more used in the ready to react, considering or evocating a malaria diagnosis when a fibrillar case does appear. Um, and 50% of the malaria cases received the diagnosis of dengue before arriving at the National Institute of Infectology. So, as you can see, this is not really very surprising, and this is the same problem to, uh, that would, uh, could occur in Paris or Berlin or New York. Uh, I have also to show you that from these cases that represent 0.4% of the cases registered in Brazil, only around 10% corresponds to autochthonous cases um, registered outside the Amazon. And uh, around 90% are imported, both from the Brazilian Amazon or from other areas, other endemic countries. So the percentage of FOSIPA that I told you is around 15% in the Amazon is higher in cases registered outside the Amazon just because it's, it's nourished by foreign uh, cases important from Africa and other Asian American case, uh, countries. Uh, I have also to say that from these cases that are considered to be autochthons, that's 10% of the 0.4% of the cases registered in Brazil, um, you have also some cases that are in fact introducer cases. So cases that result from an imported case. If an imported case arrives in a vulnerable region where the mosquito is prevalent, the vector is prevalent, you can also have some cases introduced by the fact that one imported case entered this region. And we will focus on this one, that is the profile that matters for us. Uh, these are the outbreaks of the cases occurring in valley mountain ranges in the Atlantic Forest. 
they are due to vivax or to malaria, plasmodium vivax or plasmodium malaria, or something very similar to this? And this is the question we are uh, studying uh, more deeply, more recently. And they are very morphologically similar to plasmodium, but not really exactly people that are used to do the plasmodological diagnosis are very uncomfortable in front of uh, slide uh, containing material from these patients. The anopheles that in, in, in the Amazon is uh, used to be anopheles darlingen, that is the most important vector in Brazil. In this region, is, uh, it, uh, it belongs to the subgen Cartesia, that is anopheles that uh, breeds inside the bromeliac plants that are very common in this region. Uh, um, it, it has a, a seasonal transmission and with cyclic pattern, and this is independent of detectable human cases, as are the uh, introducer cases. You have one case that arrives, and then because of this case arrived, you have other cases because you have mosquitoes that can transmit the malaria from the case that arrived, important case that arrived. And this is resistant to transmission blocking actions. This is very important because it's very different from the cases that are introduced as a very important case. Also, this is what uh, we are going to talk about. This is the Atlantic forest that is located along the Atlantic coast. And in the beginning of the last century, uh, it is supposed not to be very different from the moment where Brazil was discovered. Uh, it, it, it represented 15% uh, of the whole territory. And um, now uh, it's supposed that only 8 to 15% of this original area uh, remains. These are the actors, so this is the Anopheles Cruzai, uh, Anopheles Cartesia Cruzai, the bits inside this is, uh, I'm, sorry, I'm sorry this is dark, but uh, you have a remedial plant and you have the, the ventricle that is here and that collects water in the, in the, in the, during the rains. And uh, so the mosquito breeds inside this, this uh, collection, this small water collection. And this is very common in the, in the Atlantic forest. Uh, this is just to remember you that there are these 26 uh, plasmodium species known to, to infect non human primates, and um, sorry, including uh, plasmodium shreds in Africa. Of, and obviously also the Parafocipa, now it's in Olmo, and Brazilian uh, uh, plasmodium uh, knowledge in Asia, and uh, plasmodium brasiliano and plasmodium sim in Brazil, in this area, and they are known to be very similar to the plasmodium malaria and plasmodium vivax in men. So the question that would be asked, uh, are they really the same? Are could then be the same. Um, Brazilian would be something like a plasmodium malaria adapted to monkeys, or plasmodium malaria would be something like plasmodium brazilian adapted to men. And, um, and we know that uh, this, uh, this accidental transmission from animals, or even intended, from non human species to human beings uh, uh, does occur. And um, they are, as I told you, very similar uh, morphologically and uh, up to some time ago considered to be indistinguishable from uh, one from the other at a genetical point of view. This is not true anymore. But, um, and they are, as uh, I'm going to show you, uh, a lot of reports showing that monkeys in the Atlantic forest can be can present either DNA from uh, Plasmodium malari, Brazilian or Vivax semen, also uh, antibodies against blood or preritrocytic forms of this Plasmodium in men, from men. So we can consider that uh, it would, could be a zoonosis, so uh, um, infection that occurs and is naturally transmitted among animals that accidentally uh, occur between men. Okay. One ten? Three? Uh, okay. So this is just to show you a, 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 a work that has been done by 
by the, the group of Patricio Gazio in the National Institute of Infectology in um, Fiocruz, and particularly by Anir Pima, that must be here, yes, uh, who done his her doctoral thesis on 14, 15 cases seen from 2006 to 2014, and she followed these cases and she followed and she visited uh, all the contacts in neighbors of these individuals in the Atlantic forest. So this is the localities where they come from, where they, 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 they get infected. This is a case that probably was imported. And uh, just to show that they present obviously um, immune reactivity against Vivex uh, antigens and something very curious that eight from the 11 of these 15 patients that have been tested against falcipro presented um, uh, evidence of previous exposure to falcipro in this region that is not at all expected because this is not this is a laverrhenian parasite that is, is not supposed to occur among neotropical monkeys and but they are uh, uh, they, they are probably they have been exposed previously as you can see here both to CS antigen and SP3 in group antigens showing that they have this reactivity which we would not explain unless we consider that they have indeed been, been exposed just to show that the area where the, uh, the individual is supposed to be an important case does not show reactivity uh, to, to these plasmodium antigens but those that uh, receives individuals from the area shows this reactivity and uh, entomological studies show also the same thing. This area was not supported by the Cartesia uh, anopheles. This has been done by the Cristiano, Cristiano Brito from the René Rachou Institute in, the, in Belo Horizonte just to show you that you, we have uh, looked for uh, molecular evidence of plasmodium infection in monkeys from a national, uh, an Ibama center for primatology in that region, and we found infected individuals, including some sapajos and cerebs that were not supposed to be infected. This was the first description in this region. So they showed also the presence of Brasiliano and Simeon, and uh, also, I have to say, the presence of Ocipro in the feces of uh, two uh, animals in this same region. These are the localities where they, are, they came from, so showing different um, new areas that was not infected in, uh, found infected in the previous study in the nine years of follow-up where 15 cases were detected and I have to, sh to say that this year we have had an outbreak of 24 cases diagnosed inside the institute so there are 26 in the total in the state and 24 were seen here but this is just to show that they, 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 they got infected in a very dark dense forest areas, so they need to go inside the forest, as they usually do, uh, to, to, to be infected. So uh, we, we do not know, we, we have material from these 20, 20 of these 24 individuals uh, to do the sequencing now and to try to respond finally if seen and and, 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 um, and um, Pivax in this region are, may, can correspond to the same parasite. And um, uh, I have to say that this is, as I told at the beginning, a, 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 an ancient, an old story that we start to try to respond now and that the, answer, the final answer cannot be guaranteed by the sequencing of this parasite. But uh, yes, we do think, as Leonidas Gini, Ricardo Lorenzo and many others thought before, that monkeys can be involved in malaria in the locality. So this is the team. Thank you so much. Good morning, everybody, and uh, thanks to giving me the opportunity to talk about how to address the new challenges for malaria control program in Madagascar. <coughs> because in, in Brazil, it is a success. In Madagascar, it is not a success. So as you know, Malaria remains a uh, global public health and with uh, more than 3 billion of people in, uh, living in an uh, area at uh, risk for, the, for malaria, 
And here, the uh, vast body of Felsipor is uh, widespread and Madagascar was endemic for Plasmodium vivum. Uh, but Madagascar was, is also endemic for... Oh, sorry. But Madagascar is also endemic for a second <coughs> parasite, Plasmodium vivax. And we have more and more cases for Plasmodium vivax in the islands. So after a decade of uh, intensive malaria program, so globally we have reduced the mortality and we also the transmission leading to control and pollination uh, in some areas. However, in Madagascar this is not a success story because since 2012 we have a recrudescence of malaria cases and this year, once again, this recrudescence was very high. So, major challenge remains with an increased risk of severe malaria with declining immunity, parasite drug resistance and vector insecticide resistance, and how to maintain malaria control effort when we have no RDTs, no ACTs, and sometimes no cleaning in the field. So, we, we chose to address the following challenges in, uh, in the institute, how to follow malaria in low transmission areas and to see the real impact of malaria control program. And we chose the theological tools to uh, address these uh, challenges. And the second was uh, to address VARVAX adaptation and to identify the uh, defeat independent invasion pathway developed by this project. So we've, in collaboration with several uh, groups in uh, the Pasteur Institute network, we have raised uh, malaria immune response profiling <coughs> using multi-stage, multi-species uh, antigen arrays. And as you can see here, is we try to cover all the uh, cell, uh, cell cycle of the parasite in the human, and uh, we try to develop now uh, gametocyte markers. So I want to talk just uh, today about CSP and PSP1 uh, responses that, and the results that we, we have. So we took advantage of the Medellic project raised in uh, 2012. <coughs> Uh, with a cross-sectional study and uh, uh, where uh, infection and uh, were followed by RDTs, but also uh, we have a serum collection to evaluate the effectiveness and the impact of malaria con control program uh, implemented by the Global Fund in the islands. So we took advantage of uh, the fact that in Madagascar we have 31 sentinel sites very well uh, uh, distributed in all the islands, and we do a countrywide <coughs> survey, all ecological and transmission patterns was investigation, were investigated with uh, rural, sub -ur urban and urban places. More than uh, 40,000 of people were uh, investigated, and theological analysis were done on 11,000 of samples. So with this kind of study, we uh, realized a special a mapping of antibodies response, and here for PFMSP1, raised uh, with 2 uh, to 62 percent of seroprevalence. And you as you can see here in blue dark, many places of the uh, of the countries high, have many high seroprevalence of PF of PFMSP1. So. Here is a problem with uh, Mac to PC translation. What I want to say here is that we have a eight dependent acquisition highly related to the transmission for PFMSP1, but the antibodies, as you know, is uh, uh, persistent. And even if you have a very good control program here in Sahara, we don't reach the uh, the uh, the level 
of non-exposed people. So MSPY can be used as marker of past of recent or recent exposure. <coughs> With PFCSP we do the same thing and uh, we do also the, the special mapping of uh, the, the the cell prevalence of uh, PFCSP ranging to 0 to 99%. And here in dark blue, you can see also that we have major regions where we have a PFCSP uh, cell prevalence. And here, this, this year, we have a big epidemic of malaria with more than 90% of the fever cases due to uh, falciparum. So once again, uh, with PFCSP, we do the same studies. And as you can see here, uh, in, uh, after several years of intensive program, you can uh, raise uh, and uh, you can uh, uh, the the cell prevalence of uh, PFCSP down, and you can uh, and uh, become uh, less important than non-exposed people. Rapid decrease of anti-CSP antibodies and CSP can use uh, for recent exposure to transmission and target hot spot of recent transmission in the island. So the last year we do a, a school-based malaria survey in this part of the island where the transmission is very low with 2 to 6 percent of PFP1 cell prevalence and uh, we do the same analysis in more than 1,000, uh, 11,000 of samples. So this uh, allow us to show that uh, uh, in the, uh, among the seven districts investigated, we have some districts on Kars Bay and here on Mandutu, where we have high prevalence of PF MSP1 and PFCSP. And Mandutu, even if we cannot detect a uh, lot of number of, uh, of malaria cases with TDR, we can have a cell uh, prevalence very high indicated that the reservoir of the parasite is present and you have to target this reservoir with another uh, uh, malaria control uh, program. So, uh, using these tools, we identify <coughs> some sites where PFCSP antibodies are more prevalent and we plan to do a reactive case detection this year, but with the big epidemic that we have, we have to delay this uh, reactive case detection and just uh, follow the, the, and treat the people in the field. So, in Madagascar we have PVVAX and when we see the, uh, the reported uh, information about this parasite uh, from the World Health Organization have zero prevalence this year, so percent of PVVAX and uh, the, the the uh, malaria index surveys done also in the islands show that we have only 1% of, uh, of uh, uh, prevalence. However, with the MEDALI project, when we do the analysis, the analysis using the PVCSP, one of the markers of plasmodium uh, falciparum, you can see here that the global distribution is uh, very high with some errors with the high transmission of uh, plasmodium uh, uh, virus. So in Madagascar also we want to, talk, to, to see the GSSP deficiency in, uh, when we see this map because uh, PVVAX can have a hypnozoid in the liver and the only way to treat for the moment is for primatin uh, contraindicated when we have GSSP deficiency. And in Madagascar, like in Brazil, we have heterogeneous population, we have a mixture of duffy positive and duffy negative people. What did she mean? It's uh, the only way uh, very well uh, identified for the moment for the invasion of PBVAX into reticulocytes is a pathway involved uh, the duffy binding protein of plasmodium vivax and the duffy uh, protein in the reticulocyte membrane. However, uh, in Madagascar we have an admixture of the two populations and Duffy negative people uh, were shown in the past to be refractory to PVVAX infection. So in Madagascar, several papers show that PVVAX is commonly observed in Duffy negative Malagasy peoples. 
but also that we have a duplication of the PBDPP uh, uh, gene, what that she mean, and we, the, the, the assembly of uh, PBVAX genome show also that we have a new design named PVEBP that can also be participate to the invasion. So in this context in Madagascar, we want to know what are the new design receptor implicated in the uh, invasion of the negative people, if it is PVDBP, PVEBP, or PVRBPS. The polymorphism of this gene in the, in the, in the field, uh, what, uh, is, uh, if you can, uh, what uh, means the PVDBP duplication, and what is the new receptor at the surface of the reticulocyte. We want also to study the immune response and to define very well the PD deficiency for uh, the field. And also because uh, malaria is a, uh, uh, also a contact between vector and the parasite, what is the vector contribution to PD infection in the islands. So all of this study to guide the ongoing and future malaria control program and maybe uh, vaccine development. So we target my batana here uh, in the field this year, and what you can see when we the, the first uh, paper published a common uh, uh, invasion of Duffy negative people done in the same field. We have only two percent of Duffy negative people in infected by PBX. This year we have more than 60 percent of Duffy negative people infected by PBX in the field. So this work, uh, this, uh, work is done in a sort of collaboration between four uh, uh, units in Madagascar, my unit, Malaria Research Unit, Epidemiology and Entomology, with a big collaboration between uh, uh, the Réseau des Instituts Pasteur and several uh, uh, um, institutes, and maybe few crews because we share PVVAX and uh, uh, also uh, we want uh, PVVAX infection and with the funding of uh, PMI, USID and the Global Fund. So, thank you very much for your attention. Thank you for the invitation. It's really uh, a pleasure to give you an uh, overview of the scientific production, uh, Brazilian scientific production on which man has researched in the last years. Uh, well, this is, uh, the first thing was really, I mean, try to get uh, the numbers, uh, how we're doing in terms of which uh, man And uh, what we see here in this uh, first column, first group of columns, is that uh, the production of, of uh, in which man is from Brazil, and then we see that uh, we have uh, increased a lot of our production. Uh, as a matter of fact, Brazil, you see the last year, the country that uh, produced most papers on Leishmanite, and followed by uh, USA and India, and then UK and France. So it's really uh, an increase in numbers. I mean, of course, we have to be aware that numbers are not really the most important thing here, but uh, we are uh, in terms of and if you see the institutions in Brazil that are working on the humanizers, then uh, Phil Cruz uh, uh, is really the single institution with <coughs> the largest production of uh, humanizers in Brazil, uh, followed by USP. So it makes a lot of sense to discuss the humanizers in the context of a uh, combination of uh, effort uh, between USP and uh, Phil Cruz uh, for addressing uh, some things in, in health. And uh, what we see here is that how these institutions uh, collaborate uh, among them. And what we see here is that uh, there's a lot of interactions between uh, the Brazilian institutions. And we see here uh, Phil Cruz uh, having a, a, an important uh, role in terms of collaborating with the uh, Federal University of Rio de Janeiro, uh, Maringá, uh, Federal University of Bahia, but also uh, University of São Paulo, Minas Gerais, and Nuspi. Uh, collaborating with Spiel Cruz, but also USP uh, being responsible for uh, a strong collaboration in Brazil. So, uh, this, the picture by the numbers and collaboration seems good in terms of flash analysis and uh, in terms that uh, we are uh, producing a lot of uh, information on, uh, on science of that. 
what makes very difficult to really give an overview of uh, the several aspects. If we take a look on uh, the uh, themes that are uh, being addressed by the Brazilian investigators, we see here that we are working on uh, sand flies, on vectors, and uh, of course, even uh, there's a lot of publication on that, it's only a small fraction of it. Uh, it's really needed in terms of understanding sand flies in Brazil, only in, uh, in the Amazon, and we have more than uh, 2,000 uh, different species, and we don't know uh, anything about most of them. So it is really a challenge in terms of getting up, uh, uh, understanding of uh, what's going on. Of course, uh, several of these uh, sand flies do not transmit leishmaniasis, so we could not be, uh, maybe not important. But we, uh, if we uh, think that uh, sand fly saliva is a modulator of leishmaniasis infection, both enhancing uh, the uh, infection or uh, uh, enhancing uh, their protection against the infection, then uh, we cannot be sure that uh, the sand flies, the different uh, sand flies that do not transmit flesh may not impact on the <coughs> transmission. So it's important to understand even the sand flies that do not transmit flesh may have an impact on flesh because cross reactivity among saliva and things like that may interfere with the transmission. And uh, we uh, has reservoirs, uh, dog infection, other species, infection of other species, and uh, human. So it, it's really, a, and then uh, lots of uh, papers on vaccines and uh, therapeutics. So there's uh, uh, a huge amount of uh, knowledge to really make it. Uh, and then, uh, this is uh, the same uh, numbers. Oops, there's something missing here. Uh, it's, uh, it was really, I mean, just to show that uh, there's an increase in the numbers of uh, annual publications. It's uh, growing in the last five years, not including uh, the current year. We have uh, almost uh, 1,700 uh, publications in uh, English analysis in Brazil, with a fairly uh, uh, increase in, in, during the years. And are these uh, papers being cited? I mean, are these uh, information being used by others in terms of uh, uh, information? And then we see here that uh, Brazilian uh, uh, citations, citations of papers with the Brazilian address, I, uh, to be correct, this was the, the way that's being uh, uh, investigated the protection. It's really, uh, there's a, a fair increase. I mean, 15, uh, 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 this is uh, of course partial. Uh, it should, ma should not be counted as a total figure. But then we see that in we have an H index of 23. That's also important that uh, to address that uh, for having a calculation of citations, normally you have to wait two years in order to have a fairly numbers of citation uh, uh, of a paper. And then uh, publications from last year are not really well represented in this age index here. So it's probably that uh, we're having. <coughs> it's difficult to compare. I mean, 23 as an age index is okay or not. I mean, it's it's very difficult. For me, it seems to be low. I mean, I guess uh, Brazilian, uh, this is one of the challenges. I mean, you know, we have an accomplishment that we are producing more lynchmanizers, but we also have a challenge here that we are not really well connected, and I would uh, dare to say that we are not really producing the, uh, the most of our publications are not really in the edge of science, they're not really pushing the frontier of knowledge and are not being cited uh, uh, extensively. And, uh, and uh, what, in, in which areas are concentrated our production? Parasitology, of course, is uh, the largest one. But uh, we have lots of tropical medicine, I mean, clinical aspects of the disease being investigated or related uh, with human. Uh, veterinary science is uh, it's also important. And then comes pharmacology and pharmacy, infectious diseases, uh, and then uh, biochemistry, immunology, and uh, several other topics, chemistry and microbiology. These are really the uh, areas that are uh, available in the web of science. I could not really uh, do much more than uh, uh, discriminating that. And uh, these are really the uh, uh, publications uh, in these periods. Uh, Phil is really, I mean, uh, Phil Cruz and Luzby are responsible for most of the publications really in this, uh, in this study. And what I did really to just to have uh, to give a flavor of uh, what's being produced, I uh, listed the most cited uh, uh, Brazilian publications in this period. And then uh, we see that uh, this uh, diversity appears. I mean, I didn't mention in the uh, when I uh, 
uh, at least in the areas of production epidemiology. But the first paper that uh, really uh, uh, has been cited in Brazil in the last years is really a publication on health in Brazil, three successes and failures in the control of infection diseases. And then comes microsatellite, pro-inflammatory clearance, uh, neotelcosine in the treatment of contamination medicine methods for generation of bone marrow derived by microfibers. So, just in the uh, first five articles, <laughs> you'll see the whole diversity. I mean, we have uh, uh, epidemiology, and then we have some kind uh, of uh, investigation of molecular biology, and uh, then inflammation, treatment, and then generation of uh, something that can be used in uh, several areas. And also, uh, then it comes clinical trial uh, of uh, randomized controlled cl uh, clinical trial, leach many pseudo activity, uh, and then prevalence of factors associated with infection in dogs, uh, the discovery of markers of exposure specific to, uh, to bites of glutamine, and then is it time to, I mean, this is a review in, uh, that uh, on the nomenclature of the uh, population analysis. Elisa has been uh, appearing before, and <laughs> it's again here. And, uh, and then uh, evaluation of antilichmania activity, and I'm not going to, uh, to continue with all this, but just to emphasize that uh, it's a large scope of production in Brazil, and this is makes it difficult. I mean, if I would uh, pre present to you uh, one area, I would probably present it in human immunology or antilichmaniasis <laughs> or response to saliva, and uh, several other areas would be totally not really exposed to you. So this is, uh, the idea was really to show that we, uh, as a country, are producing in different areas of this analysis. And we are publishing in uh, a journal that are really uh, well-known, uh, top drawer journals in terms of uh, several of these uh, uh, areas. So it's really important uh, to see uh, in our international collaboration how things are producing there. And I've took, uh, I mean, of course, uh, you see, we have seven, uh, 1,700 publications in this period. And even with the USA, that is really uh, the most uh, the, uh, single uh, country that we have uh, common publications, then we have not even 10% of our papers are in collaboration with uh, the USA. And then it comes down to 49 uh, England, uh, eight, uh, 8 with Spain, and 28, and then France with uh, 22. So this is also uh, another challenge that we have uh, in the uh, Lishmanizes field, in that uh, we are kind of uh, very closed in ourselves as a community. We're not collaborating as much as we should in terms of Lishmanizes. And of course, even in Cyprus, we have lots of these questions <coughs> when we see the co-publication of authors. But everybody in the field, I would uh, think, agree that we could do much more than we are doing now. Even in Brazil, we do not collaborate as extensively as uh, we could. And this reflects that we are not collaborating with many other countries that have similar problems uh, in Latin America and uh, in other areas of the world. And uh, of course, I, I took friends here, but I did uh, not really explore the whole uh, réseau of Institut Pasteur. Uh, but uh, of course, uh, I guess Gerald is going to talk with us, talk to us about the uh, is also uh, it's a kind of cloud uh, that we can expand a lot but even though uh, the numbers are not going to be uh, big if we take this uh, approach here so it's really important that it's also a challenge that we keep the collaboration in a, a, a symposium like that could really be a good starting point to uh, think in, in terms of uh, questions that make sense to do together. It's not collaborating just for having two addresses in the paper, of course. It's really uh, collaborating for exploring questions that make sense of comparing different uh, aspects in different areas and also uh, combining our, our efforts to go to the uh, frontiers of science. I mean, if we explore together, we can really push uh, for a better uh, science in terms of, uh, of the effort. And, uh, so I, uh, since it was only uh, 22 publications with Brazil and France, uh, with address in Brazil and France in five years, uh, what are these uh, areas that we are producing together? And then from a company, uh, it's responsible for about half of this publication. So the area that is more active now in terms of publication in the last five years is really pharmacology. And then we have uh, tropical medicine that is uh, so uh, important in the production in Brazil. 
we have only three papers in five years in collaboration with friends. So this also gives a clue of uh, areas that could be enhanced, but also areas that, uh, where we can uh, have uh, uh, almost a, a totally new effort <laughs> to put groups together in terms of uh, collaboration. And uh, then uh, if we take the uh, publications uh, of uh, common address in the Brazil entrance, in this period, the Senhance is uh, the single institution with uh, most publications. And uh, then uh, Pastel do not appear here, so we're not collaborating much uh, uh, with uh, as uh, in any uh, institution in Brazil, because this is not really peer approved. I mean, it was a Brazilian and a French uh, address. And uh, maybe the biggest address that the Latino Access community has in Brazil is really that we are increasing a lot our production of knowledge. We are publishing a lot of Latino Access in several aspects of Latino Access, and uh, uh, ranging from uh, sand flies to treatment. But Latino Access continues to spread in Brazil, and the numbers of cases increase in, in the old regions, in the new regions. And uh, we have also uh, a mortality in visual analysis that uh, we could not really push down uh, below 8% as a mean. So it, what is really a huge uh, rate of mortality, 8% is unacceptable uh, for a disease, uh, disease like visual analysis. So we're not addressing <coughs> the, the uh, public health challenge of visual analysis in Brazil. So th this is the biggest challenge, I guess, is really I'm not uh, trying to uh, decrease the production in any area. Uh, what I'm proposing is really that we need a focus to, uh, to uh, besides the focuses that we have now, we have to address a new challenge that is really make uh, science to the benefit really of uh, controlling the disease. And uh, since it's spreading in Brazil, it means that uh, the efforts of controls are not addressed, uh, at least as with an impact. Uh, and, uh, and the same with uh, uh, treatment or vaccination that uh, well, could be an alternative, although I think it's going to be too long before we have an effective vaccine that uh, we need other approaches uh, while we uh, wait for a, a, a good vaccine for human. And of course, uh, there's also the point of addressing uh, the uh, vaccines of uh, dogs, as dogs can be reservoirs in the areas and, uh, I, Brazil has licensed uh, some vaccines for, for dogs, and uh, the impact is not uh, big as it, uh, expected, not even for the uh, canine disease. And uh, for the human disease, you can see that uh, uh, no impact at all. And of course, it's not expected because uh, even for uh, uh, if we had a, a totally effective vaccine against uh, uh, canine uh, leishmaniasis, visceral leishmaniasis, it's very uh, improbable that uh, we could get a, a good vaccine coverage of dogs in Brazil. So uh, even a very effective canine vaccine won't have uh, an effect, a, a, a strong effect in human diseases. So we need really approaches directed to me. Of course, vaccines against canine uh, leishmaniasis are very important for the canine disease, but not uh, as a, a way of protecting men. These, are, I do not think that uh, it's, it's close to, to this uh, area. So, uh, so we have uh, big challenges both in veterinary uh, 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 area, in the veterinary campus, but we have a lot of uh, effort needed uh, to uh, really address the problems of public health in Lishman Asset University. So thank you very much. So I had the pleasure over the past years, uh, of course, to work with uh, Brazilian colleagues. Uh, science is great. The colleagues are fantastic, and of course you have our offer, which I <laughs> love. And so there's many, many good reasons to work with, uh, with my colleagues in Brazil. Um, okay, so let me just introduce very quickly, very quickly what Leishmanize is all about. Uh, we, uh, it's a very important uh, public health uh, problem in uh, many areas of the world, and here the bottom is cut off. I don't know how to get this. Yes, you know, is there a technician somewhere? Um, so you uh, distinguish uh, different forms of leishmaniasis. We have uh, uh, the cutaneous leishmaniasis, bucocutaneous uh, leishmaniasis, uh, including here in Brazil, of course. And uh, the most severe form is, uh, is visceral leishmaniasis. Uh, the uh, are 
course, by different species of Lachlinia. Uh, we in the lab are uh, mostly focused uh, on uh, this hypothesis. They typically, because the whole thing is just uh, Maybe we should just interrupt because otherwise we won't enjoy my talk. So, yes, so we are dealing uh, in my laboratory mostly with visceralitis caused by Lashmina de Novani uh, and Lashmina infantum, which of course uh, is just more common than it's a public health problem in Brazil as well. Uh, here's just the distribution of this most severe form of flashlight uh, We uh, distinguish uh, different problems in different areas. For example, we have uh, ongoing and recurrent epidemics in East Africa and in the Indian subcontinent, where this uh, disease is historically extremely endemic. Uh, we have now new areas where the disease is actually emerging. And so through Greece, Lashmina Donovani has found its way to penetrate the European community. And this is a, a very, very big uh, public health threat. Uh, the European community has realized this and it has a lot of money. Uh, of course, we have a big problem, as far as I understand, in terms of urbanization of Leishmaniasis in Brazil. Uh, and finally, one of the biggest problems we encounter is that uh, even though we have some treatments, uh, there is a global drug resistance on the rise, and so we really need to come up with new treatments against this disease. So, uh, Leishmania, uh, shown here, is a protozoan parasite that comes in two different uh, life cycle stages. You have a so-called promastigote stage, which is uh, oval-shaped, has a flagellum, and is uh, perfectly well adapted to survive in the insect vector, which is a sandfly. Now, during a blood meal of any kind of vertebrate, uh, these parasites are inoculated into uh, the vertebrate host, and then uh, very efficiently taken up by macrophages, but rather than being destroyed by these very toxic cells, as many other pathogens would be, Leishmina exploits these macrophages as host cells, causing uh, the immunopathology that is characteristic of Leishmina. Now, while the parasite can develop from one stage to the other and knows perfectly well to adapt to these uh, different environments, we came recently across a very interesting phenomenon, uh, notably that the parasite can also evolve in these hosts. And it evolves uh, in a response, for example, even to the nutrition of the host, uh, the genotype of the host, or the presence of the microbiome, or treatment or not. So parasites undergo adaptive evolution. And I'm going to show you a little bit uh, what, what it's all about in a little while. So um, we, in my laboratory, have two major research questions. First, uh, we would like to understand how the parasite can sense uh, the insect or the uh, vertebrate environment uh, to undergo adaptive differentiation. And we're working a lot on parasite signaling, uh, fossil proteomics and protein kinase biology. On the other hand, we are very interested as well, uh, how are these parasites, once they develop in these amasticles, how can they evolve to show a uh, difference in drug susceptibility difference in pathogenicity, and even difference in tissue tropism. So we're talking about adaptive evolution uh, through genome instability. And everything we're doing finally uh, should have uh, some kind of a goal, and we're working heavily uh, in terms of anti lashing chemotherapy. And the chemotherapy, uh, just to show here, uh, we are interested in having funded programs on uh, target discovery, and validation in Leishmania. We're performing drug screening and uh, drug discovery studies, and we investigate drug resistance mechanisms. And I put here the Pasteur Institute Network because everything that we're doing right now in the lab involves partners from the Institute. Uh, and so uh, since four years, uh, um, I was uh, kind of creating a, a repertoire of what is done in terms of Leishmania research. Uh, so in yellow are all the uh, Pasteur Institutes, in blue are uh, now the Pasteur Institutes and the countries that are part of a website that I'm animating called Leishrip, uh, where 33 Leishmina labs are uh, depositing their project and capacities. I invited 23 partners outside of the Pasteur Institute just for the fact that there is a Leishmaniasis endemic, but we don't have a Pasteur Institute there yet. And so feeding, uh, feeding from these networks, so of course it was obvious uh, that we're gonna work with Brazil together because Leishmania is a very important problem here. And I wanna just very briefly uh, summarize what we're doing and give you two glimpses of some biological data. So first, uh, of course, uh, Elisa is present here in the audience. Uh, we have an ongoing collaboration with Elisa Cupolido on a consortium that is funded by the Pasteur Institute called Life Shield. And I'm gonna briefly talk at the end uh, some outlook. Uh, on this project. 
Second, we have uh, uh, part of a network uh, that is uh, uh, coordinated by Penny Smirgis from the Pasteur Institute uh, in Athens, the Hellenic Pasteur Institute. We're working with uh, Milena Soraras uh, on uh, protein kinases of Leishmania and uh, validation of uh, these kinases at drug uh, targets. Finally, uh, we uh, were nearly successful, not 100% yet. But we were uh, writing a binational uh, project uh, between ANEA and FAPSEP uh, with uh, uh, two uh, scientists, Andre Tempone and uh, Roberto Berling, uh, where we wanted to mine marine resources, uh, natural compounds, to find compounds against Leishmaniasis. So this project went the first stage, but the second stage was not accepted. We're going to resubmit, of course, because that's a really very interesting project. And finally, uh, we had a Pasteur Fio Cruz uh, project uh, funded from both institutes with Silvan Murta from the Fio Cruz in Belo Horizonte, uh, where we investigated uh, mechanisms of uh, parasite resistance. And that is a, a project that I would like to present you in more depth because we just published a paper together with uh, Silvan, uh, maybe the first one between Pasteur and Fio Cruz uh, in Leishmania. Um, so uh, Silvan came to my lab uh, for about three to four months. Uh, to learn a particular technology, phosphoproteomics, uh, that we applied to study uh, two Leishmina Brasiliensi strains that she brought with her. One was drug sensitive and the other one was drug resistant. And we had the uh, hypothesis that maybe phosphorylation could play a role in resistance as well. No one has ever investigated this in Leishmina. And so we are experts in a particular proteomics technology that is called 2D digit or differential electrophoresis. Uh, where you have uh, a purified phosphoprotein, so you can easily purify these proteins over a column. Uh, Silvan purified uh, phosphoproteins from sensitive and resistant Leishmina brasiliensis. And then you can uh, use these phosphoproteins and chemically label them in green or red. So you have two sets of proteins, one is fluorescent in green and one is fluorescent in red. And rather than running them these extracts in separate 2D gels, you can mix the extracts and run them in the same 2D gel. So there's no artifacts in migration at all. Uh, and once you uh, run this, of course, with uh, four independent biological replicates, you can then uh, run the first, second dimension, you get your 2D gel, and then you just go on a Typhoon scanner, and you can reveal the green and the red uh, proteins and calculate the abundance one or the other uh, to get some uh, statistical meaningful uh, quantification going. And finally, you can visualize the statistics like that and identify the proteins that are different between resistant and sensitive. So here's the workflow, very briefly, I don't want to go too much into detail. We had sensitive and resistant parasite that were treated or not with a drug. We had four uh, independent extracts, so this is important that we have biological replicates. We identified we, uh, purified phospho uh, proteome, and then we cross-compared all of these four samples in this 2D Deutsch experiment, creating five pairwise comparisons. Uh, between uh, untreated sensitive and treated sensitive, and so on. So you can really have everything just cross compared. This is a typical representation on the screen, looks much better, but it's okay. This is a typical representation of such a 2D digit gel. Uh, in green uh, uh, and red, you see uh, proteins that are either abundant in one or the other, and in yellow are proteins that are equally abundant in the fossil protein. First analysis we did was the principal component analysis just to see whether the four replicates of our four samples are really clustering together uh, and they do, indicating that the reproducibility of what we're doing is very, very high. Then, uh, of course, uh, we identify proteins that show different abundance between the different conditions and this is the Venn diagram that summarizes the whole result here. So you have one, two, three, four uh, different conditions, treated and untreated. And uh, in these uh, square boxes, you see the five different uh, pairwise comparisons that we can do with the different protein numbers. So these are uh, proteins that show significant difference in abundance in the various uh, comparisons. And uh, just to show you that we really did experiments. Uh, so we have here these, uh, five different groups uh, of uh, uh, pairwise comparison. Uh, with each line showing here uh, a particular protein that is four times represented here, uh, high abundant, and four times represented here, lower in abundance, because we have four replicates. And so we have, uh, uh, of course, we can compare untreated versus treated parasites and link phosphorylation to treatment, but we also can compare 
resistant versus susceptible and uh, link phosphorylation to uh, drug resistance. And so uh, once you identify all the proteins, you can interrogate what are these proteins doing, what is their annotation, and this is just a little plot here that we published in the paper, uh, demonstrating what other protein functions that are linked to either the response to treatment or linked to the resistance. And uh, very interesting, we have a lot of stress proteins, uh, protein folding, and also uh, detoxification proteins, suggesting that these pathways are regulated by phosphorylation and may be indicated in drug resistance. So the uh, first part, uh, the longer one, I uh, just want to conclude. So uh, we know that drug resistance mechanisms in Leishmania implicate genetics. So you can target, uh, the target can be mutated of a drug, or it can be amplified, that would change the IC50 for the drug. You have also biochemical drug resistance mechanisms. For example, you can decrease membrane permeability, or you can increase the transport activity to pump out the drug. So again, you can change the interstellar drug concentration, and we believe that we have identified a novel drug resistance mechanism in Leishmania, linking the susceptibility to the drug to post-translational regulation, notably phosphorylation of uh, HSP hijab proteins and uh, detoxification, detoxification activities. And so, of course, we're still going to follow up now uh, this uh, hypothesis. And I want to end here uh, just to give you a little perspective of uh, uh, future or ongoing collaboration. Uh, so we are working uh, with Elisa, uh, she's part of a big uh, uh, network, global network, that I'm coordinating. This network is again sponsored by the Pasteur Institute, it's called LifeSheet. The, the idea of LifeSheet is very simple. Uh, we would like to um, identify the phenotypic difference of LifeSheet in field isolates and uh, study what's the genomic basis of this phenotypic difference in terms of, again, drug resistance, tropism, uh, um, or virulence. And so we have various partners from the south that have access to field isolates, they know how to do epidemiology, uh, and uh, I merged uh, these people with people from the north that have uh, access to high throughput sequencing, computational biology, and of course relevant animal models. Uh, and so this is now ongoing since a year and a half. Uh, uh, people were collecting field isolates and sending it to the sequencing facility. And as part of uh, uh, this project, uh, one very important result which I want to share here with you is the following one. If you take a clinical sample, and uh, we took not a clinical sample from human but from a reservoir animal, you can sequence the genome of the reservoir animal. And this is shown here in, uh, in green, uh, a uh, genome, uh, the result of genome sequencing where we could see that uh, most of the uh, chromosomes that are here one by one uh, are disonic. However, if you take this sample and you put it in culture, suddenly, and this is shown in red, you have many anapodes that start to emerge. Uh, the genome is evolving in culture as soon as after two passages, which of course means that this uh, evolution is, um, uh, uh, we believe, masking totally the epidemiological information. Culture adaptation causes a major bias, uh, and uh, because it's again a sort of selection. So Lashmina evolves through chromosome amplification, um, and of course culture adaptation uh, is maybe not the best way to do epidemiology. Um, another very good thing coming out from Lashfield, and here I have to thank Elisa that she uh, sent us two excellent uh, teachers. So just last week we had the first symposium on Lashmina epidemiology and transmission. In Paris, here's the program. Uh, here are the people, uh, teachers and students, uh, confounded with Gabrielle and Mariana from Theo Cruz being present, and they did an excellent job uh, in teaching the students. Uh, and so I just uh, want to give you the outlook here uh, that this project, Life Shield, is just at the pilot phase. We have many years to come to expand this into something even more meaningful, and uh, I hope that Brazil and Theo Cruz uh, will be uh, heavily engaged. Uh, and that. And finally, I would like to thank you and thank my laboratory, uh, and especially also Pascal Pechera, who is uh, Mrs. Brazil in my laboratory. Thank you very much.